In 1913, pioneer film director D.W. Griffith said, The moving picture, although a growth of only a few years, is boundless in its scope and endless in its possibilities. The task I'm trying to achieve is, above all, to make you see. Created in 1970, Anthology Film Archives collects, exhibits, preserves, and provides research facilities to study and see moving pictures. The staff of the archives, shown here flanking Jonas Makis, maintains a collection of more than 4,000 films and videotapes, from Buster Keaton and Charlie Chaplin, Greed and Citizen Kane, to historic independent filmmakers like Maya Deren, Stan Brackage, and Joseph Cornell, a collection of the monuments of cinematic art. When Anthology first opened, one innovation was a theater that isolated viewers from one another. Andy Warhol, John Lennon, and Yoko Ono often joined Jonas Mikus to view screenings of the classic as well as the new works of independent filmmakers. In 1974, video screenings were added to Anthology's programs. Here, Shigeko Kubota and Namjoon Paik speak to audiences at the weekly in-person screenings. In 1975, the archives began its publications program, which has produced six books, film culture magazine, and catalogs. These publications explore realms of motion pictures that other museums and archives have ignored. Anthology's commitment to collecting and preserving films has been saluted by the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. For eight weeks, the Academy presented in Los Angeles a series of films restored by the archives' preservation program. Well, independent film was born in this city with a film in the 1920s called Manhattan, and it was an expression of the unique, special voice of the artist. For a long time, New York City was the only place in America where independent and avant-garde film had an audience and institutions to support it. And because of this, a very special relationship has emerged between the city and independent film. This kind of film has changed the way all of us see the world, and that is why we are so very pleased about the archive's impending renovation of that Second Avenue courthouse, its transformation into a museum of the cinema. America needs such a museum, and New York City, the home of independent film, justifiably will be the central place where it can be studied, where it can be preserved and shown to the scholars and to the general public. The new home of the archives, the Second Avenue Courthouse. Built in 1917, purchased from the city of New York by the archives in 1979, renovation now in progress. We are now in the smaller 72 the seat theater area, which uh, will be our the avant-garde film, the essential film collection repertory, two or three programs every day on a repertory basis. On the right side, looking from the Second Avenue, there will be a special structure built uh, devoted to the preservation of the paper materials. That is our reference library. What you see on the first floor here, where the prison cells used to be, oh, that is the first floor film preservation area or vault, and higher there, the same size, you see the second preservation for the color film, pre film and video preservation. Uh, this will be the largest, actually, film and video preservation vault on this coast and most of to date. Uh, there will be some space there for the offices too. We are walking now to the, our third theater, which is all purpose theater. The whole history of motion pictures will be visible on a regular basis in this theater from the turn-of-the-century science fiction of George Melius to the surrealism of Luis Buñuel and Salvador Dali in the 20s to Kenneth Anger's Rabbit's Moon of the 50s. Films by Elia Kazan and Orson Welles, Alfred Hitchcock and John Ford, Fritz Lang and Stanley Kubrick, and new films and retrospectives, documentaries, animated films. The whole heritage of cinema's first hundred years will be on the screens of the archives. It will be a resource of creative and historic importance. If one were dreaming about the effect that this building could have on the people of New York, it would be very much like what Henri Langlois did in Paris. Through collecting films and showing them at the French Cinematheque, he was able to influence uh, Truffaut 
Godard, a whole generation of young filmmakers. What Jonas Mekas is doing by presenting five hermetic repertories at various points in the year in this beautiful auditorium, and it will be beautiful, believe me, uh, he's preparing the ground for filmmakers to continue to make films. Motion picture films and videotapes are fragile. They consist of a flexible plastic base, an image holding emulsion, and a chemical binder. Apart from the damage that results when film or tape is torn or stretched, storing film or tape under conditions without proper temperature or humidity controls jeopardizes their existence. If the film or tape becomes brittle, cracks, shrinks, or flakes, irreplaceable works are lost forever. Poor storage invariably results in damage of this kind. With ideal storage in proper vaults, the life of a film can be extended to more than a century. The emulsions for color are just as vulnerable. Unstable temperature and humidity can cause color film to fade, reticulate, and shift. Since 1972, Anthology has spent close to $600,000 to restore and archivally preserve black and white and color film produced during this century, from the work of Fernand Leger to the more recent achievements of Joseph Cornell and Maya Deren. Anthology's preservation programs for film and for videotape are unique. No other museum focuses on the works of independent artists. At the courthouse on 2nd Avenue, Anthology will build two large vaults for archival preservation. Each vault will be able to hold at least 10,000 reels. If you watched 12 hours a day, it would take four years to see the entire collection. Preservation is also the fundamental purpose of Anthology's library where reference materials and irreplaceable books, manuscripts, photographs, tapes, and posters complement our film and video collections. The archives catalogs and maintains a unique collection of writings. These spectators from the film, Blood of a Point, have been identified as the film's financial backers. Rare letters written by Sergei Eisenstein, Hans Richter, Jerome Hill, and the pioneering art dealer Julian Levy are accessible only through this facility. For a decade, it has been the place where scholars, students, and educators have superimposed this body of literature over the work itself. In some cases, such as that of Maya Deren, the filmmaker has provided historians with a vast legacy of critical and theoretical writings. Twenty years ago, when I applied for the visa, first my first visa to America, Jonas Mekas was my financial sponsor, although he didn't have a penny in bank. Luckily, American consulate in Tokyo didn't check his bank, like the sneak in. Now, 20 years later, today Jonas is as bad financially as that time, but as good as that time editorial, if I may say. I guess it's, it will be the most active video uh, or showcase uh, in the city, <laughs> probably anywhere, with, with over 20 different programs weekly. We're standing on the corner of 2nd Avenue and 2nd Street, and the courthouse, the former courthouse, which will be the Film Anthology Archive, is looming in its beautiful brick, New York Romanesque 1919 style. One of the most important aspects of this will be the fact that the community wanted it, that the community will use it, and that there'll be a facility in the community which is handsome and looked at with approval. It will influence the look of the neighborhood. The community is tremendously excited about it, and local grassroots groups are in great support of it. Andy Warhol's reputation in the early 1960s was based on his silkscreen prints and the films he made in New York, films first shown by Jonas Makis. And Jonas Mikas was in charge, and he was the most exciting person. I mean, he just got excited about anything, and uh, he got excited about just leader. And so uh, I decided, well, if you can get excited about leader, I just do leader. And so I just did a lot of leader, and it was exciting. Anthology Film Archives is the only museum anywhere dedicated to the independently made film and video. During the last 20, 30 years, cinema has branched out into numerous directions and branches. There used to be only one thing, the commercial, popular film. Today, 
that cannot be said any longer. Cinema is made in every town of this country and actually every other country by individual people that are not backed by large companies, their documentary, very personal documentary films, diary films, very personal small poem, little poems, maybe one minute long, maybe ten minutes long, maybe six, seven hours long. There is a variety of different approaches to cinema uh, that has uh, developed during the last two or three decades. And Anthology Film Archives is dedicated to this screening, preservation and study of all these directions primarily. Ziga Vertov, whose man with a movie camera we have seen several times in this film, said this about movies some 50 years ago. I am a mechanical eye. I, a machine, am showing you a world the likes of which only I can see. My road is toward the creation of a fresh perception of the world. Thus I decipher, in a new way, the world unknown to you. The Kino eye is a means of making the invisible visible, the obscure clear, the hidden obvious, the disguised exposed. <laughs>